Ladies will ever be. <laughs> okay. Then we are live on YouTube and we're recording, so ready to go. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming. On behalf of the Indigenous Sound Studies Working Group, I would like to welcome everyone to the second Indigenous Sound Studies Symposium at UC Berkeley. Our theme this year is Indigenous Relations and Unexpectedness, Intergenerational Sound Knowledge. The idea of this symposium grew out of a graduate seminar taught by John Carlos Correa in the fall of 2021, titled Indigeneity, Self-Determination, and Improvisation. The graduate student panelists, Tori, Christina, myself, and Ever, were all students in this course. We hope this symposium brings all of our various works together to embody and enact Indigenous relations and contribute to the um, intergenerational conversations of Indigenous sound studies. Thank you. Um, before we begin, we would like to do a land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territorial uh, Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Rona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be a great of importance to the Moekma Ohlone tribe and other descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use uh, and occupation of this land since the institution's foundation in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land, acknowledge, land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work toward holding the University of California, Berkeley, more accountable, accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Um, so now we'll just do an introduction of ourselves. So, um, Nanotoka Ever, um, Nan Nemo Machtia Ethnomusicology, Ika UC Berkeley. Um, so, my name is Everardo Reyes. Um, I'm borrowing some of the language from um, Nawaf to show solidarity. I'm of Rada Amadi descent, and I am a third year PhD student in ethnomusicology working at the intersections of um, radio activism and uh, music. Um, hi, everyone. I am also a coordinator of the Indigenous Sound Studies Working Group. Um, I'll introduce myself in Dene. Yate, Shee, Shee, Do, Shee, Dene, Shee, Sierra, Eddie, Misha, Oganish, Kitachi, Bashishi, Kitachi, Dashiche, Philip was a fun and Dashanala, Ako, Ego, Dene, Azan, and Nishla. So I um, in Dine, and I grew up in the Four Corners in Durango, Colorado. And I am, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm currently a fourth year in the Ethnic Studies uh, graduate uh, department at um, UC Berkeley. And we are going to take a moment to uh, thank our sponsors for this event. So, first, uh, the UC Berkeley American Indian Graduate Program, the Native American Student Development Office. Um, and we're currently in the space, uh, the, the new space, um, the Native Community Center, um, where NASD has an office. Um, also, the Office of Graduate Diversity, and finally, the Center for Race and Gender. Additionally, we would like to thank all of the individual staff and community members who provided help, support, and guidance throughout the planning um, process, such as Lisette Bastidas and Val Sierra, who are the two other coordinators for the Indigenous Sound Studies Working Group, as well as NASD folks, including Kenosha Barley, Antonio Basita, and the undergraduate staff. Thank you. So this symposium will be broadcasted as a Zoom webinar created by UC Berkeley's Native American and Student Development Office. Today, we are joined by two keynote speakers who will be presenting for 20 minutes each. After the presentations, we will take questions from the audience for about 20 minutes. Um, after the keynote section, we'll be going on to the two grad student panelists. Um, and then so after that, we'll be going to the grad student panelists, which are a few. And then we'll be doing uh, closing the event with two performances. 
um, which you can read more about on the schedule. Um, and I think for online, that will be on the link. Uh, for online guests, we ask that you please use a Q&A feature to pose your questions for the panelists, um, questions that receive a lot of likes or pumps up into priority. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So now we're going to introduce our first presenter, Jessica Bissett Perea. Jessica is an Ina Alaska Native um, interdisciplinary musician scholar and is currently an assistant professor of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Her indigenous led and indigen indigeneity centered work advances radical and relational ways of being, knowing, and doing to generate more just futures for indigenous communities. So um, yeah, I'll welcome Jessica and hand over to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, not actually. So just okay. Shoot it up? Yeah. Good morning, and thank you very much to this beautiful space, uh, Fenosha and the Native American Community Center. Thank you, Eber, Sierra, Lisette, and Val for the working group uh, invitation to be here with you today, this morning. And um, what I thought I would do is riff a little bit on the idea of who's listening. Uh, and I take that from, or borrow from it, uh, a really amazing book by Megan Bang and Doug Medine, uh, titled Who's Asking When They're Thinking About Native Ways of Doing Science, Western Ways of Doing Science and Science Education. That's been a lot of my work uh, for the past year and a half. And so today in thinking about asking the question, who is listening? I wanna think about unexpected and expected relationalities with and through indigenous sound logics. And I'll do that in three pieces. I'll start with an introduction and I'll explain more about the introduction after I get through it some indigeneity questions that animate my work, and then to talk about how introductions uh, are related to relational frameworks and are a relational framework themselves. You'll hear me uh, refer several times throughout to uh, a tripartite framework that I loosely call uh, people's places and projects, which are related to ways of being or ontologies, places, ways of knowing, or epistemologies and projects, ways of doing, or methodology. So those are the logics of which I'm speaking today. Yaladu, Jessica Bissett Prayash, Ili Kilan. Then Aina Dakishna Eshlan Shida. Kanakatna Eshlan Shida. Kanakatnu Shugu Shagaya Kilanda. Sheldina Rele Te Ana Eshlan Shida. Nochina Eshlan Shida. Mkoya Shata Nik Nikola Shigurila. Shita A Virginia Color Shigurila. Phyllis Dow Shita A Janta Shata A Ki Rilana. Shunta Debbie Platt in Lanan Kudi. Shidesna Ketsi Dineh Eshlan Shida. Mary Burkholder Shita Kenneth Pissett Shata Rilana. Shunta Ronald Pissett in Lanan Kudi. Skizla Rayatni. Shunta Stukta Ale Mita Shugu Kotan Ratna Reluda Hali Staja Rachel Staja John Carlos Prayush Kenny Josephine Staa Jacob Shea Chochenio Loni Atlena Huchin Shugu Yishtuda But when it line up with the toy, I should go your studer. Chenon Heshka Shashnu. Then I inact the daily sheep. My academic pursuits have led me from Denina Athlena, my ancestral homelands, 
to Coast Salish lands currently occupied by Edmonds Community College, where I earned a general transfer degree and performed with a semi-professional vocal jazz ensemble, to Yakima lands currently occupied by Central Washington University, where I earned a bachelor's degree in music education with an emphasis in jazz education and double bass performance to Numu Nue and Washishu lands, currently occupied by the University of Nevada, Reno, where I earned a Master of Arts degree in music history and founded and directed the department's vocal jazz ensemble program. To Gabriel and Tongva lands, currently occupied by the University of California, Los Angeles, where I earned a PhD in musicology, my dissertation titled The Politics of Inuit Musical Modernities in Alaska. I work on Putwin lands currently occupied by the University of California, Davis, where I'm an associate professor and graduate advisor in the Department of Native American Studies. Some of my current projects that I'm engaged in right now are the ones that I wanna highlight for today, anyhow, um, stem from the work that culminates in the book that just came out in November. Uh, my first book proposes Native Musicking as a project for amplifying the densities of our Indigenous being as Indigenous peoples, as sounding our knowledges rooted in lands, waters, and sacred places, and as integral to self-determination movements and resurgence projects. And I also want to take a moment to think about um, folks who have uh, taught me along the way, my various teachers, from bass teachers to musicologists and, and but for today, I wanna to focus on these last four individuals, but uh, perhaps Phil Deloria more specifically since he is one of the, the muses for today's events. But with coming out of my, earning my PhD, I've been very fortunate to be mentored by uh, George Lipsitz, Beverly Diamond, Phil Deloria, and Nina Eichheim, uh, who have been um, very uh, instrumental in my own development, transitioning out of music studies and into native studies and it is the kind of work that I value today, which is quite different from about a decade ago. This, this idea of intergenerational conversations is also very important. Um, this is a slide that we made earlier this year to um, articulate not the presence really, a lot of what my work is interested in is presence and sound or silence and absence, and even the kind of mixing and remixing of those ideas together. But one of the things that always concerned me um, was finding people who had survived things that I had survived, right? So I first looked for other Alaska Native people who had earned PhDs. But when thinking about our own field of music and sound studies, or music more specifically, there are only 15 of us who have um, survived the disciplining of music studies to date. And we're hoping that that changes, especially with the fourth generation rising, which we have several folks here, uh, part of the symposium who are part of that. Um, but it is important to just think about um, not only the immense amount of work that had been done already by the first and second generation and the work that we as part of the third generation are involved in um, cannot be uh, separated from the kind of work that we're hoping to see come into being with you all, the fourth generation and, and beyond. Uh, one of the other projects is co-editing a book with most of the third generation and some second generation uh, music sound studies scholars called Sovereign Aesthetics, Indigenous Approaches to Sound Studies, co-editing with my colleague Trevor Reed. Um, and it began as a keywords for Indigenous sound studies in 2018 in Santa Fe. So that was um, a fun time. But um, perhaps the most rewarding work that I do at UC Davis is with the Indigeneity Collaboratory, um, a kind of arts humanities lab I've created because you're in academia, you can just create things. You can make up words, you can make up labs. So I did it. And this is, these are my nine advisees um, who are doing um, immensely important work. And you'll hear from two of them today, uh, Tori and Christina. Um, but some of the other work that folks who are not here today are doing involve things, uh, rematriating stolen children from boarding school graveyards and rematriating them back home to coastal communities in Alaska, to Dine weaving and indigenous feminist perspectives on uh, what it means to re revive and, and uh, reawaken weaving practices in Pinona, Arizona, uh, to herring protectors and the kind of really important work about environmental justice and uh, environmental justice also in Anonymous communities. So I'm, I'm extremely proud and, and privileged to work with these individuals and, and to, uh, it gives me a lot of hope for, again, the next generation of what's coming and what's to be. Um, 
two of the main questions that we think a lot about or that I think a lot about and I, I certainly exam my students on <laughs> in terms of uh, thinking about what are indigeneity questions. It comes from a, a piece that I did with a colleague for um, an American music journal that was really questioning what happens if you put uh, indigeneity at the center of music and sound studies, especially in the Americas, right? And so part of that was thinking about what is the purpose of music and sound studies? What are the terms of engagement that we use? What are ways of knowing and doing that are prioritized? And how might we better uplift the density, uh, not the difference or diversity of indigenous being? I'll get more into density in a moment. But this ultimately comes to a question of how can music and sound studies research do work with, by, and for trans, queer, two-spirit, and indigenous black and peoples of color communities? And these are the particular constituents that myself and my collaboratory are uh, engaged with. It's not by any means uh, exclusive or, or the only uh, folks that we can be thinking with by and for. But if we think to answer this question, um, one of the obvious places to start uh, is to value these ontologies and epistemologies from these communities as sounding methodologies, that music is an as history and genealogy, as law, as medicine, as science, as religion, as environmental policy management, as pedagogy, and many, many more. And so it's not metaphorical. Music is history. Music is medicine. Music is many things. And so it's this, again, that slight epistemological shift from on and about to with by for that gives us the ability to argue for different things, unexpected things in these academic spaces. So in terms of thinking about the importance of an introduction, and that's the kind of sound practice I wanna focus on today, um, as an Alaska Native woman in diaspora and a professor of Native American studies, and as someone who works with fine four Native peoples and communities, I feel it's important to always begin. And it's a practice I really got in the um, habit of, especially during the pandemic, when we had to create moments of relationality over Zoom, like we are now with folks who are, who are not here in the room. And especially on a 10 week quarter, as such as at Davis, there's not much time to, to humanize ourselves to one another, to find points of connection. And so in thinking about how I could use intertribal visiting protocols to help speed that is why you see things on slides it translated in denying the language, but also with English uh, subtitles below them, that it, it matters that we take time to position ourselves in relation to our work uh, and also to think about why we gather in the first place. And part of that is to recognize who's in the room. Um, and so while we might not have time for all of us to do that here today, I just encourage everyone to think about how you might think about incorporating introductory pro protocols, visiting protocols in, in not only gatherings, but classes and, and other kinds of places that people gather. Um, intertribal introductions are embedded with what might call an ethics of invitation. And in my own experience, in intertribal Alaska Native and Circumpolar Arctic spaces, introductions of one's people's places and projects are meant to locate relations, as in who is related to who, via blood and, and adoption and more, as well as to generate new relations. Um, maybe there was something in my introduction that you have a connection to, and that's the whole point of, of speaking these things, not only my blood and adopted relations, but the places I've been, that we have a point of connection. And um, there's a nice anecdote from the work we're doing with our colleagues, Ilse Matusafik Kalafit Nunat, University of Greenland, where Greenlanders consider themselves related if you share a birthday. So mm -hmm. there's any number of ways that you can find relation and again, humanize and make connections with people that unexpected and expected in these places. So this idea of invitational um, is definitely uh, taken from or inspired by uh, performance spaces, intertribal Alaska Native per performance spaces, where there is a drum song genre called an invitational, where anybody in the room is invited to uh, perform and improvise in space time, an indigenous led space time, and it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, everybody becomes in relation through the act of kind of embodied um, relationality and dancing. And it's just a way to emphasize again, it's going to take many different kinds of people doing different kinds of work um, to find those points of relation to move the needle on things like social justice. So I was not timing myself. I think I have, oh, 
Okay, fine. So what I want to blast through really quickly again is when I give my introductions, um, it's been really interesting because I started them in classes um, where as an assignment, it becomes very easy to understand what the points are behind it. But when I give it, say, in music studies context, um, I've been met with some very interesting reactions, everything from folks wondering why I would do this kind of emotional labor or um, what it is that I'm confessing, or how is this separating me from notions of objectivity? And that's really the whole point. And the who's listening and the who's asking is really about unsettling these expectations that these colonial institutions make for us. That's how these places are framed. And that's what's so incredibly important about using sound and music studies to think otherwise and to think beyond the expectations of a colonial institution. And so this idea that um, also, you know, the question of like, well, I'm not native, can I do this kind of introduction? Introductions are for everybody. Um, it's really important that, especially in, in Native and American Indian uh, Indigenous Studies context, we have to talk about who we are in relation to who we're working with by and for, regardless of how you identify. But I would argue that there is incredible value of doing this in microbiology settings. There's incredible value in doing this in you know, a com com comparative literature settings that we can't assume that who we are and who the authors that we may be reading are or who the, the you know, guest speakers are. These things matter. These things carry power. These things carry privilege. And they are of course always already uh, racialized. So this idea of an introduction as a seemingly simple gesture using the sound of indigenous language in, in my case, um, really comes from a framework that I've been thinking about. It started as densi densities of indigeneity, but it's much broader than that. It's about densities of relationality. And again, as I briefly explained in the beginning, what I mean by peoples are beings and identities and not just human beings. That we don't, peoples that will include rock peoples, water peoples, you know, bug peoples, bird peoples, every, all kinds of peoples that everything has souls and everything has ways of being. We might be speaking about human beings most of the time, but we are not being exclusive. With places, again, logics and analytics, the places and spaces, um, institutions as a space, right? Uh, for framing and, and developing the ways that we, we think and know the world. Projects as actions and practices, ways of doing, and that these come with these kind of internal questions of how to start maybe thinking about your own way of introducing yourself. Who are you and to whom are you responsible? That's how most intertribal introductions will begin in Alaska, it's telling us who your grandparents are, who your parents are, who your siblings are, who your uh, partners are, your children, that these are the people to whom you're responsible. Where are you from and what places have shaped you? And with projects, um, definitely inspired by Linda Tuivo Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies and the 25 projects, but now 20 more additional projects in the third edition, that we have to think about what it is that we do, because part of what um, this whole framework is, is about getting away from simply claiming identities or claiming uh, uh, whether that's an identity that's racialized or an identity that's professionalized, like as a professor, right? Or a student, um, what do these things really mean? Because in Yupik context in particular, which is what my book focuses on, to know anything about say a Yupik mother, you have to follow the mother around to see what she does. You have to see what people do in order to understand who they are, um, that these things are interrelated, right? And so this idea of these internal questions then lead to external, who is asking and who can ask, what is being asked and what can be known and how is the asking taking place and what can be done. So the whole point of kind of making this messy slide again is just to get at the density of something as simple as an introduction that it, it seems to be taken for granted, I think, in a lot of spaces when it could be doing so, uh, significantly more work. And again, if to emphasize the relationality of webs of responsibility as between human and more than human, and the idea of density from Métis scholar Chris Anderson riffing on Black historian Robin D.G. Kelly's work on the density of Black being, what Anderson is using it as is a way to critique the ways that when we institutionalize something like Native American and Indigenous studies, there is a danger of homogenizing um, you know, methodologies, um, canons of, of literature and even music, right? But that what we have to always be attentive to is density instead of tokenizing difference. That um, these 
words like Native American are incredibly dense with thousands and thousands of tribes throughout the Americas, thousands of languages, thousands of aunties, grandmas, and grandpas, right? That we have to be very attentive to the particularities if we want a more profound complexity, a greater clarity, and a potential for emancipation. So I think that feels like about 20 minutes. I don't want to keep going. <laughs> I should have timed myself, but thank you. Pass it off to John oh, yeah. introduction. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Professor John Carlos Pereira. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce him. Um, John Carlos is Mascalero Apache Irish Chicano Chairman. He is currently a um, visiting associate professor in the Department of Music at the University of California, Berkeley. Since 2010, he's an associate professor of American Indian Studies in the College of Ethnic Studies at the San Francisco State University. He researches, uh, his research interests include jazz and improvisation, uh, improvised music performance and composition, urban American Indian lived experiences and cultural practices, music technologies, recording and archiving practices, social constructs of noise, um, native and African American jazz cultures, and the Creek and called jazz saxophonist, Jim Pepper. Uh, Um, I wanted to uh, start by uh, doing something to support the land acknowledgement the job begun with. Um, one of the things since I've been here that uh, has was, was something I knew from being in the Bay Area for a while, but I did not know this exact number, right, uh, with regards to, to NAGPRA on campus. Right, there's 9,500 ancestors on campus who are still trying to go home. Mm -hmm. And that's been a, a number and idea, especially on this side of campus, close to the buildings, where you I think you can't help but think about that, or you shouldn't be able to help from thinking about that. And, and, and so one of the things uh, I've been doing this spring was just uh, to, as uh, Dr. Bispare before me had mentioned, to uh, want to 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 have a song to make sure that in addition to the land and the people getting knowledge, getting acknowledged, there's a, a song for them as as well. Might not be a song from where they're from. Uh, this is was taught to me by uh, Dr. Barney Horner from uh, Wakpala and Standing Rock, uh, but it's one to to remember. This is a a, a song that says, uh, "Where have you gone? Your people uh, depend on you. Your people need you." So just in support of those opening statements that were uh, made by the students and the work that still needs to get on, on campus, I'd like to begin with this and then I'll, I'll get into the rest of it. So thank you very much.
So let's see. Uh, my name is John Carlos Perea. My mother is Barbara Perea from uh, Long Island, New York. My father is Jacob Perea from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, Mescalero, Apache, and Chicano on my dad's side. I'm German and Irish on my mom's side. Uh, I was born in Dulce, New Mexico, and then my parents moved out to San Francisco uh, 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 when my uh, dad got a job there in the College of Ethnic Studies. And so uh, at that uh, time, for me, when uh, he came out, my growing up in the area was very much focused around San Francisco State. So one of my places, right, to, to, to proceed in the, in the manner that Dr. Bisbray has set out, one of my places really is, is, is San Francisco State. I was really fortunate there to be able to study with and spend time with and visit with a lot of people, uh, most probably, influential on me, Dr. Barney Honer, again, from Wapala, South Dakota. He was a, a lecturer, a veterinarian with a very successful practice out here in uh, Walnut Creek. Uh, many of his family are uh, still in the Albany area and were able to uh, keep in touch. Uh, he taught me a lot of his songs when I was his TA in his music class. And so my, my practice uh, that has really shaped me for the longest time has been really the receiving of Barney's practice in the classroom, which was teaching powwow singing at the uh, university set. Right? Uh, he had a whole set of songs he would teach us. He had a drum that he would bring in because he felt that nobody was going to be able to understand the music unless you had the chance to be able to sit down and see what that experience was like. Right. Guided by him so that everybody, again, understood their responsibility, regardless of whether they were native or not. So for me, San Francisco State really is a place and a space. Uh, 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 the Powell singing in the classroom is passed on through Barney Horner. Um, one of the other things, though, that was very influential to me when I was growing up as a little kid was getting to come over to Berkeley with my dad. Uh, my dad got his EDD here. Right. Uh, and I can remember taking BART trips to, uh, with my father to come over here when he had something to do. Uh, there was a, a breakfast place that used to be on Shattuck. It's a Vietnamese restaurant now. And we would go in there and that was always this thing. We'd do the BART ride and then we'd come and we'd have breakfast and then we'd come walk through here. Right. And so to be able to come back here, both as a graduate student to get my MA and my PhD in music, but then also to come back as a visiting professor. Right, has really been an honor and a privilege for which I am grateful. And I want to say thank you to the students who came out during the pandemic to all of those classes that Ever and Sierra mentioned at the beginning, to all, to Patrick and Fenosha and so many who have supported the kind of work that is going on. I can remember before I came out watching all the news about the building on namings and about this space that we're in, right? And I said to Fenosha, it's really exciting to be able to talk and sing in this space because I remember when we were graduate students and we used to have firebird sales on the back, uh, back patio here, I remember getting a noise complaint out on this corner, right? When I was out there singing, trying to draw attention. And so it's kind of nice to be inside being able to do it, right? <laughs> so, so, so all of that history has come into this past year I've been able to spend here. And, and, and so... That for me is, is kind of what I just want to focus on uh, 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 for a second. I, I can remember the uh, American Indian Graduate Student Association conferences that used to happen back then uh, when I was a graduate student. There was a particular one. It was Fenosha and Dory and Danica who were putting it on. Uh, I had a sound system and I brought it up and we set it up on the eighth, uh, eighth floor when we used to do the, the conferences up there, right? Um, I think that was where I got Brian Wright McLeod's Encyclopedia of Native Music because Fenosha uh, was putting out the books and she said, you should grab that. And I did, right? I still have that copy actually, right? So uh, we're up there and that was the year that Phil Deloria came out, right? And that was when Indians and in Unexpected Places had just come out. And I think for music folks, such as myself and many others, that was the first time we had seen a book that somebody was talking about music in a different way, right? When we said, well, okay, so here's all these things, but, but, but instead of it being all of this loss and deficit, 
What if also we acknowledge that because we can't say that that didn't happen, but what if we also look at the things that changed and how we talk about the things that changed, right? Uh, that was a moment for me as a graduate student that I don't know where I'd be if we hadn't had that opportunity. And so again, I'm grateful back then to, be, to, to have had that because when I came in, you already had those conferences set up. I just got to come in and, 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 and so I'm grateful for that infrastructure that was already here and is still here. Right, very grateful for that. So that unexpectedness coming back 12 years later as a visiting professor, right? I wanna speak about that just for a second is sort of a report back, right? What has happened during the last year, right? Um, in coming back to teach, I realized that the classes that we got to do are really classes that I've had in development for 12 years. I just didn't get to teach. Right, because you have different curricular needs in American Indian studies than you do in a music department. In the music department, we got to do some more creative things. They had their own pressures, right? But in that seminar, uh, we had ethnic studies, we had education, we had music, we had performance studies, right? It was really exciting. And so in that process, I would look at you all when we were sitting around the table, right? And there were times where I would think to myself, God, I wish I could bring the drum, right? And I think, but at that time, it, it, some people were comfortable, some people weren't. We still all had this most of the time. And I, I know that there are lots of people who have figured out how to keep singing and I respect them for it. For, for me, I haven't been able to get quite there yet because I never wanted this to be something where somebody else could get hurt, right? And so for me, I haven't found that spot. Most respect to those who have, right? Not, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying for myself, in the context of this year, I, I couldn't quite figure out how to get there, right? And on the course of the fall, it really drive me nuts because I'd say, God, I missed the singing, I missed the singing because that was my practice. So fall semester ended, we came back to the spring, spring semester, we're back in that room, seminars, graduate and undergraduate going around the table. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, you've been doing this the whole time. You're just not seeing what's in front of you, right? And so what I would like to say thank you for over the course of this past year and hopefully leave you with, right, uh, to be able to grow in a way that you find uh, relevant and useful. What I realized, what I realized in the course of the year, right, especially this just this past spring, was that that seminar table, right, was our drum, right? That seminar table was our drum. I was getting hung up on the stick. I was getting hung up on the idea of the song, right? But what I realized this spring, right, is that for myself, I'm still sitting there and it's my responsibility to lead the discussion, lead the song, right? If you've ever had the opportunity to be around a drum or see a drum, the lead singer also has the responsibility when it's somebody else's turn to go, Right. And, you know, when you get this, you can't give it back. Right. You, 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 once you get that, you have to take it. You have to do something with it. And so last fall, there were plenty of times where I looked at Tori you know, or when I looked at Christina or see it. Right. And I realized, no, you've been doing it the same way. You're leading off. Right. You come in with an idea. You're leading off. You're giving it to other people. Everybody's if, if you reframe the singing as that process of relating of inviting people to relate, then actually we've been singing all year, mm -hmm. right? And when, I, when that hit me this spring, I thought, oh God, you see, you were missing it the whole time because you were getting hung up on stuff, right? But when you expand it a little bit more, it becomes so much broader. Right? And some of the other uh, possibilities with that, right? You know, we, we eat to try to eat together, go get a cup of coffee together, tell bad jokes with each other. All of that is also my memory of what drum rehearsals were like, right? So it wasn't just the, the circularity of the table. It was all of the relations taking place through that experience of being with each other, right? And so it was a much more musical way to think about this process. As uh, Dr. Bisbury likes to say, a more musical Native studies and a Native studies that is more attuned to sound. Right? So I want to thank you all for that because I honestly, the past, the fall, 
I, I, I was really getting stressed out. And this spring, I realized, no, we've just been doing it the whole time. You just have to twist it a, a, a little bit and, and let go of some other things. But in that process, oh, man, it, it, it has just become, become something that is exciting, I know, for me. Now, now let me say this, though. Uh, some of you here or in, a, uh, in, in, in the virtual space may be thinking, well, my people don't use that drum. We, maybe we use a clapper stick. Maybe you use a shaker. Maybe you use a water drum. That's fine. Make it whatever you need it to be. Right? doesn't need to be that kind of drum if you don't need it. It needs to be whatever it is that helps us get through and to imagine not what this place is, but following George Lips, it's what it could be. And that is another one of the things I'd like to say thank you for over the course of this year. It, it wasn't what this place is. That was how it was when I came here as a graduate student. I came away from all of our meetings thinking, oh man, what this place could be. I remember having that conversation with Fenosha. There's a moment happening with the unnamings and with this space, right? There's such a wonderful moment happening. And I'm very grateful to have spent a year being part of it and looking forward to continuing to uh, learn how I can keep supporting it, regardless of where I end up. And I hope that that idea of the seminar table as a drum or as a stick or whatever you need it to be, can be helpful in that process of thinking about sound studies, not just as this song or that song, but as something that is more broader, more encompassing, more relational, more dense, right? That helps each of us get through what it is we are here to do in a good way. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, John Carlos, for that talk and also Jessica. Um, so now we're going to move to taking questions and um, we'll take any in-person questions here and then also uh, they'll let us know if we have any um, online questions or stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think just to start us off, um, both of you kind of mentioned your um, kind of routes of travel of just like going through different places and how that um, kind of built up and led to your journey in academia. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to like our um, relationships with various geographies um, and kind of how that comes out within your projects. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like open-ended um, and you can kind of take it however you want. So I think that what, <laughs> as I like to say, as a native Alaska native in diaspora, um, the first 20, two decades, we'll say, <laughs> of my life was, was deeply framed with my identity as, as an Alaskan, as a native Alaskan, Alaskan native. And as soon as I could get out, I got out <laughs> to go to college. But I think that what I realized along the way was being able to think about home in a new way, right? Seeing it with new eyes, seeing it with new logics or analytics that I was gaining through my travels and through my um, time uh, in, in mostly jazz education. And then eventually thinking about, um, you know, Alaska's place in Native American and Indigenous studies, because we are a bit of a present absence in, that, in those spaces. So I think that in terms of geographies um, and also having been at UC Davis for the past nine years, I started by kind of constantly looking back and thinking about what does it mean to be an Alaska Native in diaspora? What does it mean to be in California, the place I've been the longest since leaving home? Um, and how do I try to do things that are in better relation to uh, Putwin, to Ohlone, to all the different and the many intertribal folks who have always lived in this area as well. So the ways that I think place matters um, is, is something that I think is just a continual project, right? And that 
we've done some different things at Davis, like thinking about um, the Native North Pacific work groups that we've had. That there's folks in here who've been in there and um, thinking about these areas and geographies beyond the nation state borders and thinking about ways of being in better relation by, by doing projects that, that foreground our, the particularities of, of ourselves, right, and our families, because even within, say, a Denina community, there are no, <laughs> there, there are similarities, but there's just so many differences uh, between and amongst us as well, right? So honoring the kinds of value that we each bring into a space like academia that is deeply informed by the places we come from and the peoples that are associated with those places. We carry our peoples and our places with us. Um, is something that, um, you know, it's one of the other things that troubles me about um, some of the ways that we also talk about place or space is that we can only be uh, ex an expected or a, a, a real Alaska Native if I'm in Alaska, right? But again, I will die on the hill that says we carry our peoples and our places with us. Um, and that there's good work that we can do uh, from being one of the few is, is outside in the lower 48. We've got all kinds of names for down here, but uh, <laughs> those are those are some of the things that come to mind in terms of, you know, it, it, you by kind of increasing one's I don't know, transnationalism, one's cosmopolitanism, whatever word works for you. Um, gives you a different set of tools that can maybe be useful in some way through either the academic publications that we do or the mentoring of students and getting them through degrees that we do in these places. So, I don't know, those are some of my, my rambling thoughts on that. Dr. Perry? So, when you said uh, geographies, the first thing that came to mind for me was growing up in uh, proximity in relation to Alcatraz, right? And for me growing up, that was different stages, right? Because at first it's the first time you go out on the boat for the sunrise ceremony and you will experience that, right? And it's learning about that process of the ways that people map that journey and then how that journey uh, had implications for organizing after that. As I got older and I got more into music though, it became even more so about the sound of the people doing that work. So uh, the video archive, for example, at San Francisco State of all the uh, uh, television coverage of the occupation and the interviews of Richard Oakes reading the proclamation or Lenata Wardek uh, being interviewed and talking about what people are, are doing there, right? So, so at first it was that movement, right? Learning about the island and going back and forth and engaging in that process, seeing people and meeting people. But then it also became about the sound of how people talked about it, right? Uh, so, so I thought about that. Um, also, it, it also reminds me of being in high school and taking Bart to, to mission and, and, and walking up the street and for how many years doing that and realizing that I was walking right by where the American Indian Cultural Center was, right? And realizing that with, I, at that point when I was in high school and I didn't even know it, I was still walking through that space. So that geography even there, right, was connecting me. Uh, I think that maybe comes back to some of the things we've talked about with travelography, mm -hmm. right? Where you, it's this process of always learning how you can be in relation to, mm -hmm. right? And in learning that relation, learning the responsibilities that come along with it. Those are just some things that came up when you initially said geography. There's probably more, but. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. <laughs> having a really uh, two-day um, 
very heavy theoretical conversation with Lauren Coulter um, <laughs> at UC Davis. And then, mm -hmm. of course, the most generative conversation was after Dr. Coulter. We go longer there, we're all kind of like a little bit more relaxed and kind of like, <laughs> what do you think about you know, places? And so, um, I guess I kind of want to drag that conversation in. So, we were talking about theory as a thing that travels. Mm -hmm. So music is theory. We mm -hmm. know that we don't need to get started with the question, right? So I guess it's just a thought that I want to think about I, I, what if we think of music as encounter, right? So this is one of the things that we were talking about um, after the talk is that and as indigenous people, we have been encountering each other. Also meaning we have been exchanging juries. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, the my center of my um, scholarship is the Pacific, the ocean. The title of Dr. Coulter's talk was Once Were Maoists. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it made me think of um, the Progress Amorville, mm -hmm. Once Were Pacific. Mm -hmm. The question of what if we center the ocean, yeah. right? And so here we're talking about what if we center music, mm -hmm. sound, language. In conversation with how we make and travel, right? Knowledge is, I think, I guess I just kind of want to present it out there and start thinking about like, what does that, what does musicology mm -hmm. look like? And this idea of people, places, job three, relationality. Mm -hmm. If we start thinking about sound as an encounter. So, mm -hmm. just, uh, I guess, just. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that is certainly why I put Native Ways of Doing Music History in my book title, <laughs> is to push that issue, that musicology for a long time, even musicologists like Susan McClary will say that the field has been extractive. And I've said this many times, so you forgive me for those of you that have already heard this, but this idea of musicology taking from literary theory and you know comparative literature and you know cultural studies and all the things but what does musicology give back mm -hmm. it's it's a, a, an important open question <laughs> one that hopefully will prompt more of us that have these skills in, in music studies to and or those of us who center music and sound studies to do things that are you know useful and and legible understandable um, to to folks outside of you don't have to have had, you know, a counterpoint to understand what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And those are things that, again, when I say we have survived, the 15 of us have survived music disciplining. I mean that. Yeah. I mean that. I'm tenured now. I can say that. I mean that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, and I think that music studies is at a place where it is realizing that it needs to do things differently. And what I would argue for is the densifying of it. But the idea of music as an encounter, it points to what is still a value of, of thinking about what are the tools that we do learn in music and sound studies that can be of use for thinking differently, for generating new ways of understanding what it means to be in good relation, right? That we, it's orality and oralness, oralness are things that are always underestimated. But yet we can't help but feel it. And again, it's part of this um, other model that I'm, for those of you that spend time with me, I'm very influenced by uh, Stalo scholar Joanne Archibald and her story work, um, which, you know, part of the goal <laughs> of kind of being able to visit through respect and reciprocity, reverence and re uh, relationality is to get to synergy, uh, interrelatedness, but holism. And that holism is getting out of just the intellectual or the mind space, which is what this place is built for, mm -hmm. and getting into getting out of the head, getting into the body, getting into the heart, the emotions, and the soul. And so all of that is what I've been arguing anytime I get a chance <laughs> in these music study spaces um, is the next the next thing that music studies needs to do um, is is really in performance studies is doing this beautifully already um, in terms of thinking about embodiment as as you know legitimate ways of understanding and knowing the world, but orality and sound are things that are not yet valued in the same way. Because um, there's an immense amount of gatekeeping around encounters with music and music studies departments when it's kind of like when you say Native studies only happens in Native studies departments. What happens when we're everywhere? What happens when music and sound is taken seriously everywhere? So that's
that's that would be my rant on that. Right. When I think about some of the stuff we've talked about over the over the past uh, year that I've been around, your question makes me think of things like. Um, There's a book by Ellis Lasseter and Kotai called The Jesus Road about Kyle and him singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rob Kotai talks about uh, the language in and around the song. So if you're going to get called upon to lead a song in the hymn singing context, you've got to know the words, but then you also have to know how to read the room. And in reading the room, know how to explain the song so that that engagement of the group happens, with you, right? To me, that sounds similar to, I don't want to say the same as because he's talking about a specific context, but for me, that's very similar to thinking about what an MC can do at a powwow or a lead singer can do, right? And, and, and so that idea of not just how people encounter sound, but the, but the different levels through which they do it, they might do it through language, they might do it through someone's intervention over the mic during a song or explanation beforehand. There's so many different and interesting levels to think about how people engage, right? That's been one that's come up over the over the past year. The other thing that's come up over the past year, uh, yeah, uh, thinking about Julian Henrique's sonic bodies and phonographies by Alexander Rogelio, the ideas of thinking with and thinking through sound mm -hmm. rather than thinking about sound, right? So sometimes when you think about sound. You can take something out and given an analysis project maybe you need to get it one thing such as radio broadcast and not tries right and take certain things out but you got to be careful with that otherwise it becomes the extractor mm -hmm. the, the in the in the uh, classes we have this semester that idea of thinking through and thinking with has been really valuable to again mm -hmm. sort of change the conversation a little bit to get it i think some of the mm -hmm. issues maybe you're talking about and something that connects both what Sarah asked and Wenda asked is this idea too of improvisation yeah. and just the need to be kind of open and curious enough about other people's and places and projects to to be receptive and, and available to engage to encounter right to do and to do it in a way that you know is not extractive is not all these other things and so there's there's something about thinking about processes that we learn either around the drum or in jazz contexts in terms of what it means to share time and space musically with people. I think that there's there's ways of being with each other, the relationality or sociality of that, that, um, you know, we all improvise, every one of us improvises, but we don't really think about it that way. And it's the same thing around if we gatekeep what we mean by a musician or someone who is a sound artist or these other things, then what are we really gaining when we do that? Um, I would be on the side of the argument that says nothing, <laughs> but it's it's a really interesting thing to think about when we because we're traveling. We've always already been traveling and migratory. We're not measured and contained in the ways that the colonial government, nation state, wants us to be. So this idea that um, our theories and our practices travel with us, our peoples and our places travel with us, and those inform the ways that we can engage in these spaces. And that is, in, you know. One many could argue an, an improvisational uh, mode of being. So, anyway. um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I think we're about time for uh, the question, but thank you again for the presentation. Thank you very much.
Christina. Are we on? Okay. Hello. So now we're here with our um, graduate student panel. So to get us started with the graduate student panel, I will introduce this first speaker, um, Christina Thompson. Um, is a third year PhD student attending the University of California Davis in the Native American Studies Department. Uh, she is earning a des designated emphasis in performance and practice studies. She's indigenous scholar, vocalist, dancer, cultural activist, and language warrior. Christina's practice is rooted in the Great Basin, more specifically Northern Nevada. Um, her primary fields of study are historical musicology and language, regeneration of the Noran Paiute language. Her research amplifies native ways of doing music history, privileging Paiute knowledges, languages, and performance as a means to indigenize music studies curriculum. Um, Christina. Good morning, everyone. Oh, oh is it all work? Sorry. Okay. Isha Awama. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Abra, for the introduction. And I just wanted to say thank you for those who put the symposium on. Uh, I was really honored to be asked to share my work um, and to be here with fellow UCD and professors that I've been working with. So thank you guys for, for having me. Uh, I wanted to start out, let me start this. <clears throat> um, so ne dao kutsmana mina nia, ne kwewe tu karamina o ne pat wenwe te, ne nema te bong kopi no ma uh, so my name again is Christina Thomas. I am Northern Paiute and Western Shoshone uh, from the Great Basin, which is located in Northern Nevada. Um, I grew up, as you can see on the map, I circled Pyramid Lake, that's where I grew up. Um, and I went to school at the University of Nevada Reno, which you see also circled, and um, kind of a more broader outline of, of our, our territorial, where our homelands are. Um, so Northern Paiute has 23 different bands. Um, it is estimated that we now have around 13 different dialects. At one point, our language had 21, over 21 dialects. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so this is where I grew up, uh, the Lake Circle. So we call it Kuiwi Banere, which is uh, the place where our fish, our ancient supper fish, um, they are endemic to Pyramid Lake. And it is the band that I am named after. So in my introduction, I said I'm a Kuiwi Takata, which is I am a Kuiwi eater from Pyramid Lake. And this next picture is uh, very important because it's our Pia Tupi, which is our stone mother. And so this is where uh, our origin story as people take place um, from her tears from this lake and the story goes with it of how our different bands emerged. So I wanted to share just some photos so you can kind of put a, a, a place on the map, but then also know that it has a connection not only just to where I grew up, but also that we have stories from which our people came from this place. All right, so I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Nevada, Reno. I uh, got my bachelor's in music and I did it uh, focus on vocal performance. And I also got a minor in biology. And so I was actually on my way to dental school um, until uh, a colleague of Dr. Perea um, went to school with her. And I was telling her more about the work that I do in my community. And at that time I was establishing uh, Northern Paiute at the University of Nevada, Reno as the first indigenous uh, language in the state of Nevada. And she's like, you should just really talk to her. I think that you you might maybe like to go to UC Davis. And I was like, mm, no, I don't think so. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm good. I'm gonna be a dentist, you know? So I had, I had a scholarship and I was like, nope, I'm set. And then I was like, well, let's just see what happens. So long story short, I had a great conversation with Jessica and found out all the things that I have been doing in my community. I could do it at UC Davis and pursue a doctoral degree. So. I ended up here at UC Davis. Um, last June, I got my master's in Native American studies, and I'm currently a third year PhD student um, in NAS. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and I just kind of wanted to share some photos and um, to remind not only myself, but this is why I do the work that I do. Uh, for me, uh, earning my PhD is not just to get, you know, to have those fancy letters behind my name or to earn a piece of paper, but for me, it's really for the people in these photos, um, the elders that I work with, the kids, uh, my son. Um, I really truly enjoy teaching our language and teaching our song and dance to children back home. And so this is why, what I do, why I'm here. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. <clears throat> so before we start, I kind of um, made this little mind map um, and I know it's a lot if you look at it right now, but if you, you can kind of see how everything and even hearing um, both Dr. Priya and both Dr. Priya um, speaking about their, about their work and some of these like same people they mentioned, scholars they mentioned, and even some of these same concepts kind of come around. But I just kind of wanted to show it on, on here so you can kind of see where I was kind of going right here where you see the pine nut blessing and um, story. Um, how all these different things come from it, right? Like where you don't think, oh, but, but they are actually all, all connected as you can see. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to show this and then I will briefly kind of go over, obviously this would take a really long time to go through every single thing and how they connect, but I just kind of wanted to share some of the main things that I've kind of been, that really stuck out to me and some of the work that I've recently been doing. Um, so I just wanted to show this at first and then we'll talk as I go through and we'll share it again at the end the end and maybe some of these keywords or scholars will stand out to you. <clears throat> All right. So I wanted to share these songs with you guys. Um, I wasn't able to go home. My grandparents were going to bring me some actual um, cones and uh, with the actual like uh, branches so I could explain this a little better. But um, the weather of the past they didn't make it. So we're just going to improvise, like Dr. Claire was saying, improvisation. And so um, I did have these, these cones. These are from back home, but they're just obviously they dried out. But um, so usually like in the springtime, our people hold um, blessings over our, our pine nuts. So Tuba, our pine nut was a staple food um, where we're from. And so in the spring and in the fall, we would do ceremonies and have song and dance where we were praying for them to grow big and then when we gather giving thanks and so we had these um, protocols and, and blessings and prayers that we did at certain times and so I just kind of wanted to share um, two songs since this is a music and sound symposium I wanted to share some songs um, that are perfect for right now because we're we're blessing the pinets for right now. So I just wanted to share these two songs really quick and then we'll kind of talk about how these two songs play a part in some of the things that I'm going to be presenting. So typically when we pray, you would gather um, on a branch on a tabakbi, which is a pine nut tree, you would grab a, a male and a female cone. So usually the female cone's a lot bigger, but this is just all I had. So the female cone's bigger and then the male cone. So then you would take the cone and if you were near running water, you would place the, the, the cones in the branch in the running water while you say the, the prayer. Um, if you weren't near running water, which kind of has more effect today just because of how things have changed with climate change and places to access our, our pine nuts, um, people will also bury them in the ground and say a prayer. So this first one, Tuba uh, Buinzi, it just literally means little pine nut seed. So you're just talking about the little pine nut because you see here in the bottom left picture, the cone is green. And so the cones are still inside developing and getting there, they're still small. So it's just talking about the little, the little seed that's growing. So I'll just go ahead and share a little bit of that. So it just says, Tuba Boinzi, Tuba Boinzi, Tuba Boinzi. Tuba buinzi, makamalo buinzi, bakwari vina, makamalo buinzi, bakwari vina. Tuba buinzi, tuba buinzi, tuba buinzi, tuba buinzi, makamalo buinzi. Bakwari vina, makamalo boindi, bakwari vina. So 
So then the next one, you see in the other picture where the cone is emerging, we call that a, a cone, which means open cone, the, the pine nuts are coming out of the seed. So I'll just sing one just for time's sake. But a lot of our songs just repeat because um, we would literally dance and sing them up until the sun came up the next morning. Um, so I'll just go ahead and share one, one verse of this one. So this one is just talking about the tuba is pine nut. Siboin is emerged. So it's literally saying pine nut emerging from the cone. Um, so it's just. Tubat siboin, tubat siboin, yahe, yahe. Tubat siboin, tubat siboin, yahe, yahe. Tubat siboin, tubat siboin, yahe, yahe. So with those two songs, um, I kind of, so thinking back to that map and like all those different things, um, I really wanted to focus on four kind of key scholars that I was thinking of. So the first is um, in thinking of sounding in place, right? So in my introduction, I talked about who I am, where I come from, um, and how that relation, as you see in the picture here with the stone mother, right? So like that's a, a space in place that is, that is for not only um, my band, but also like the Paiute people. So you see on the, the kind of map, it's a, it has like the current cities, but then next to it, we have what we would call them because we described uh, the cities, <laughs> the areas by what we ate. And so somebody would be able to know um, what what band you were from based upon your clothing, your dialect, and then what you said that you ate. We knew the area well enough to know like, oh, you're from there, that's where you eat trout, or you're from down south, you eat this. So they all have a connection to space and place. Um, like our stone mother story, the, the storytelling has a place of history. So thinking of Basso when he talks about the places and spaces that um, the Apache people had, you know, the names of the mountains and the history that the history that went on there. Um, we too have that, like almost, you know, indigenous peoples have that where, where we come from, right? We have stories and our own histories and relation to the land with that. And so I was thinking about also how language um, for us, because we have a deep connection with not only um, our language in the lake, but it's also said that when both, when our Kiwi ceased to exist, our language would also. And around the same time that both, they both were kind of categorized as, as, as extinct. And so we have stories that tell with that, that ties into language. Um, and so a lot of my work is having to do with the regeneration and bringing forward our language that's been kind of sleeping for too long, as well as some of the songs. And then so speaking of story work, and like Dr. Prey was talking about <laughs> Joanne Archibald's holism, how everything is connected, not only just the people, the land, the animals, the community, everything has to happen and for that, for that to take place, right? So she calls that holism. And I, I really like this approach um, as she talks about like thinking about learning about stories, because it makes the when you listen to an elder tell a story, um, you know, there's there's lessons in that and you really have to listen and pay attention to those things when they're telling the story. And it makes you kind of your own interpretation to think about what they're telling you or what's the moral behind it. And I think a lot of times in Western academia, we're always told what to think and what is right and what is not. Um, and then also we had um, within those stories, we had our social customs, like how to be a good, how to be a good human, human being, um, teachings, and then also how healing comes through with our spirituality, right? Because all of that is connected. Our prayers, our prayer songs are connected through our language. So everything is, has been connected and trying to get back to this, like what we've been doing since time immemorial. I have to go through my 12 months. <laughs> so another thing, uh, another scholar I was thinking of in relation to kind of connects also to holism is uh, Oscar Quagley's um, tetrahedral um, universe, uh, like you see up here, the worldview. And so this really talks about like the, I'm kind of working with like our indigenous ways of being, knowing and doing and kind of bringing those things back into the academia and decolonizing some of the things that we aren't necessarily, that aren't, um, 
you know, what Western academics would consider knowledge, right? And so kind of just like that dismantling and going back to using our language, our stories, our elders, our sound, and reusing that interconnectedness because everything is connected, right? So we saw through different, different models and also even that mind map, everything is connected. All right, so our embodiment. So I was in thinking about embodiment um, in relation to Deborah Miranda's My Body is an Archive and also just personal experiences I've had of ancestors coming uh, to visit me through dreams and sharing songs and, and dances. And so just kind of um, having that unexpected, what most would consider like unexpected ways of knowledge transfer. Um, but how that also goes into with, you know, with sweats and other, other things that people, other tribes do um, that doesn't necessarily always like, you know, read from a book or even in a song that sometimes these things you learn from the water, from the animals or even from your ancestors that are not in this, in this realm with us. And then really quick going back to that map. So you can kind of see where some of these things um, Coagley, uh, Anderson, the prayers are on here. Um, everything is connected, but I just wanted to kind of like hone that back in. Um, we can talk more about it in the questions. I don't want to take up time, but um, I did kind of want to just briefly mention um, how, what my work is doing. And so I've been, I've been documenting songs. Um, I've, they're called Numa Nagata, which is, um, they were called pageant dance songs, but I really did not like that terminology. Um, and so I've just been working with recording and notating uh, these songs and dances. Um, and it's the first time this has been done in my community. Um, so I've really been having a lot of fun working with the community elders and teaching the dances um, to the kids, um, especially, it's been really fun. And I guess I can just leave the questions for the end since I'm at 15, I don't wanna to take too much of Tori's time. So I guess I could, we'll just talk about the questions after. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Christina, for sharing your work. Our next presenter is Tori Johnston. Tori Johnston is um, Quinault, Quinault? Quinault. Quinault uh, is a Quinault PhD student in Native American studies with a designated emphasis in environmental humanities, um, second, science and technology studies, and third, studies in performance and practice um, at UC Davis. His research interests include critical indigenous studies approaches to ecomusicology, um, canal or oralities um, and ontologies and musicking, canal um, specific practices and knowledge systems, tribal sovereignty, governance, and resource management. Um, so, yeah, uh, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you. If I can get this. Uh... Thing. There we go. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I want to do is thank Ever and Sierra for inviting me for this presentation, um, Christina and I. Um, I always thought there's an Indigenous Sound Studies working group down here. There's no reason we shouldn't be together having conversations like this. And so I'm super grateful to be here and super grateful to be following up. Doctors Perea, Jessica, and John Carlos, <laughs> and their um, presentations. Um, so I'm just going to go right into it. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm having kind of mix up on my screens here. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Anubitu, I'm Tori Johnston, and I'm Quinault from Tohola on the mouth of the Quinault River. 
I'm a self-taught guitarist, cat father. Her name is Rika, music theorist, third year PhD student and emerging musicologist, examining the confluences between music, sound, nationhood, science, and technology. My family, the Chinoos family, have all been lifelong residents of Tahola. My great-grandparents were Edwina and Daniel Chinoos. My aunties and grandma were Alice, Louise, Roseanne, and Edith. This generation of my family and the lands and waters we come from are my foundation for engaging intellectually with Native American and indigenous studies. My immediate family are Kiwi Chinoos, David Johnston, Tyson and Alyssa Johnston, Hazel Rhodes and River Jackson. We have all lived in Tahola and other places in what we now call Washington state. My siblings, mother, niece and nephew all live in or near Tahola and work for the tribe. I grew up on Snob Hill, just up the tribal admin building. While you can't see my house in this picture, much of my life growing up was spent not only on the river, but at Tahola School, both pictured here. Tahola School is a K through 12 institution with around 250 students when I was going there. My graduating class was relatively large at 13. <laughs> in 2010, I moved from the village to Duwamish and Suquamish homelands, commonly known as Seattle. There I studied American Indian studies as an attempt to bring some intellectual consonants into being. I felt more at home, away from home in American Indian studies classes. Upon getting my BA in American Indian studies, I had a brief stint at home working for our Cobell land buyback program, but I really needed to leave the res. So I decided to move to Seattle where I accepted a position at Seattle Indian Health Board's Youth Services Department. I was a project coordinator for an IHS funded youth suicide prevention initiative. Recognizing my existential anxiety around the concept of growth and intellectual development and inspired by my Chinese family legacy, I decided to pursue an MA in Native American Studies in Potwin Territory at UC Davis. My original plan was to get the MA and go to law school, particularly to practice in environmental law and policy spaces. While my first year of graduate study was wonderful and filled with opportunity, I felt a slight dissonance. Though the path I was pursuing was admirable, and I might have even been suited to it, or at least capable, there was something that I was ignoring that came to light when I took Dr. Inez Hernandez Avila's uh, NAS 254, or uh, Native Literature gradu Graduate Seminar. Up to that point, I'd been ignoring the musicality of my being, at least as, it's represent as it represents and occupies a significant part of my mind, body, and spirit. Knowing that we have at least one faculty in NAS that's a trained musicologist, I took this as a cosmic signaling and decided to change my career path to indigenous sound and music studies. I applied for the PhD program, completed my MA exam and continued the work. Through my roots and routes, I find myself in Ohlone territory based in San Francisco, where I play in a band called Dysfunctional, Dis F-U-N-K Functional, and plan on vis uh, finishing out my coursework and qualifying exams in 2022. More than ever, music and sound have become my practical and theoretical home base. The research I will be presenting today is a theoretical basis for an upcoming summer project generously funded by the UC Davis Mellon Public Scholars Program. I'm a part of a cohort of 10 UC Davis doctoral students who will be identifying, addressing, and collaborating with members of the public through scholarship. In my case, I'll be working with the Quinault Indian Nation tribal members in Tahola, the village that you all met earlier. With the support of a faculty partner, I will develop a community-based project that will emphasize Quinault-led and Quinault-centered research practices. This project is necessarily collaborative in principle and will be grounded in Quinault relationships to the community of Tahola, um, the broader topographic region of the Pacific Northwest coastline, and Quinault ways of knowing and being that have existed since time immemorial. By utilizing musicking as a methodology rather than an object to apply theory to, I will investigate the nexus between Quinault oralities, governance, and North Pacific lands and waters. The main outcomes of this project are ideally an oral, an oral archive of Quinault song and a set of protocols to bring together Quinault drummers and singers and Quinault government officials. The project was born from a simple question that I discussed with my friends from back home. Why is it that our QIN government, governing systems and our cultural programs separate? Our collective inquiry comes from the recognition of Quinault song and dance as spiritually important. 
a practice that should be integrated into our ways of doing sovereignty. The title of my summer project is Putting a Song on Taptana, Quinault Musicking for Sound Protocols. Taptana means beach or shoreline in Quinault. I want to bring attention to the phrase Quinault Musicking here. Utilizing Christopher Small's verbification of music into musicking, this phrase allows for the capaciousness of musicking as an activity rather than music being a thing or an object. Quinault musicking then relies on the Quinaultness, which takes for granted that we are both Quinault and figuring out what that means simultaneously, to borrow phrasing from Robert Warrior on intellectual warriorship. Moving on to sound protocols, my intention is to challenge Deborah Kapchan's conception of sound knowledge as a non-discursive form of affective transmission by asserting Pacific Northwest native protocols, the ways in which we relate to ourselves, our communities, other communities, and more than human beings. Protocol carries the weight of many meanings from an ethic, a way of relating, and a noun by which native peoples describe the trading of embodied musicing practices and ceremony. Thus, sound protocols are discursive forms of affective transmission, and they are informed by our deep relationships to the lands and waters of the Pacific coast. The methodological focus of Musicking is inspired by Linda Tuhiwai Smith's 25 plus 20 indigenous projects. My primary reason for employing Musicking as a methodology is the ontoepistemological presence of Musicking in Quinault life in Tohola. While there have been notable examples of Musicking as methodology, most eminently Dr. Trevor Reed's chapter Yiwa as methodology in indigenous knowledge systems and research methodologies, I hope that this summer project, specifically in my dissertation more broadly, can contribute to a more sounded indigenous studies, a call that I always come back to from Dr. Jessica Bissett Perea's 2012 article in Music Cultures. My secondary interest in, interest in musicking is a little more selfish. I'm a musician myself, and though I'm not classically trained in neither the Western sense nor the Quinault sense, I argue that our relationships to music and sound still carry potent ways of knowing and relating which are animated by sound protocols and praxis. To put it simple, simply, there is no possible way that whatever field work I end up doing does not involve making music with people. My hope is that contributing to the theoretical groundwork of musicking in this way can disaggregate the extra musical and re-aggregate um, and get people thinking about musicking's discursive potential across many disciplines and issues that one might not think our music is relevant to. My interest in musicking as methodology started in 2020 when I was in NAS 246, Indigenous Research Methodologies. We were assigned the wonderful collection of short essays, sources and methods in Indigenous studies edited by Chris Anderson and Jeannie O'Brien. I noticed the collection was distinctly lacking a musically focused chapter, even though the book was open to other creative media, specifically film and literature. I also noticed an irony in this very volume where Chris Anderson calls for the promiscuity in indigenous studies research. If we are to be indiscriminate about indigenous knowledge production, then why isn't music included in this volume? While I think that there are valid reasons for the lack of music in this book, such as time constraints or that the authors might not have been aware of indigenous sound studies research yet, um, the inclusion of literature and film in particular left me wondering, what are the weaknesses in seeing the differences in creative media? I would argue that film, literature, poetry, dance, performance, even things like skateboarding, all possess a potent ontoepistemological dimension to them. I would argue that we would be better off thinking about the commonalities rather than the differences between media. Viewed in this way, to provide a few examples, there's a musicality to most kinds of media, just as there is a lyricism to visual art, an embodied engagement in composition and improvisation, a rhythm to film, rhetorical elements in dance, etc. The ontoepistemological elements of indigenous creative projects harmonize well with Dr. Linda, Linda Tuhiwai Smith's 25 plus 20 indigenous projects framework. To Dr. Tuhiwai Smith, indigenous research is ambitious. It's both very strategic and thematic of cultural survival, self-determination, healing, restoration, and social justice. In the 2021 edition of Decolonizing Methodologies, Dr. Tehiwai Smith outlines 20 more projects. Um, and in the new chapter, she states um, that she uses the term project because she sees the idea as work, as intellectual, creative, spiritual, collective, individual, and physical work. 
To me, that idea of a project isn't far removed from the idea of playing music with people. And similarly, music king is critical to cultural survival, self-determination, healing, restoration, and social justice. The way I choose to bring the world of research and the world of Penalt Music King together is to think about Indigenous Music King in three eyes, immemorial, improvisatory, and digilogics. These are the three themes that will structure my methodology. Immemorial. For this section, I'm interested in Diane Millian's essay in theorizing native studies in conversation with musicological histories and to ground my work with Quinault musicians. Dr. Millian's essay, There's a River in Me, is a necessary intervention to the logics of theory in the realm of academia and the broader settler colonial institutions that uphold these logics. One provocative statement that she makes is something to the effect of, we have always been theorists. Upon my first read through, I thought we all must also have always been musicians. I'm also interested in Dr. Millian's conceptualization of theories and how it can be useful in accompaniment with indigenous musicking, musicological histories, and quinault oralities. Dr. Millian describes theory as a set of relays from one theoretical point to another and a relay from one practice to another, a linking. Thus, theories are essentially social in that they link certain ways of intuiting, feeling, and thinking to other ways of intuiting, feeling, and thinking. They realign the felt imag imagination at the parameters of the way things are thought to be. This is a strategic felt comprehension that has the power to change a paradigm or reinvest a political movement with a new vision to act. These narratives mobilize boundaries of what can be felt, thought, and acted upon. This way of thinking about theory is useful for understanding the relationships between music, um, sorry, relationships to music between and across boundaries of indigeneity and settler colonialism. The immemorial framework of musicking as methodology is concerned with the ways that settler colonial and indigenous ways of knowing music have both mobilized the boundaries of what could be felt, thought, and acted upon. The section on improvisation in, in my project is interested in accompaniment, unexpectedness, and the connections between creative expression as a way to mobilize theory into practice. Primarily working from Lipsitz and Tomlinson's conceptualization of accompaniment requiring empathy and writings that have brought together indigenous histories and critical improvisation studies, the goal is to dig into Lipsitz's notion of what the music could be by demonstrating the improvisatory musical dimensions of Quinault music making. Simply put, Quinault drum group is an improvisation in itself. It's typically conducted through a Facebook post and whoever's available just kind of shows up. Mm -hmm. Seeing this as improvisation allows for an analysis that recognizes quotidian acts of indigeneity through different media. Though I am interested less in the representational aspects of this and more in the ontological. To bring this further, as a musician who will be co-learning Quinault song along my, alongside my peers, but with my own musical repertoire, what comes out of the project might not be what one thinks of when they think of Quinault song. Um, I'm hoping to challenge both my own and my Quinault relatives anamnesis, the reminiscence in which a past situation or atmosphere is brought back to the listener's consciousness provoked by a particular signal or sonic context. This final section in Digilogics will bring together the theoretical approach of native ways of doing music history by Dr. Jessica Bissett Perea and Dr. Trevor Reed's UAS methodology as practice. Rather than showing how these two texts are exemplary towards an indigilogical approach to music historiography, the goal of this section will be to use their examples to conceptualize new indigenous projects that are distinctly musical. For my project, I'll take sovereign, sovereignty oriented approach to music making, recording and dissemination with the goal of bringing together the Quinault spheres of governance and cultural practice. While the project's origins lie in addressing a need, the practices that inform Quinault musicking and oralities are animated by immemorial improvisatory digilogics. By taking a sound protocols approach to Quinault music making, this project aims to challenge the ways that we listen to one another and, uh, and are more than human relatives. Seal quo for listening to my presentation. Thank you both, uh, Christine and Tori, for your wonderful presentations. Um, 
we're going to go ahead and transition into the questions. So I can start us off with a question and then I'll take um, any questions from the audience if we have any. Um, yeah, I really like how both of you kind of touched on um, indigenous frameworks and philosophy and um, specifically like the embodied and spirituality of sound. So I'm wondering if you can speak more to the like extra musical or more than human um, affordances of like sound studies um, within an indigenous like framework. And also um, if you can like talk more about the like sound sensory um, interventions, like if you see any like in your projects. Well, one thing I was thinking about, because um, I've heard Christina sing those songs a few times now, probably like three to five times. Um, and this time I really was just, I, I was kind of reflexively thinking about what goes on in my head while I'm hearing this specific song. Like I heard the explanation about pine nut gathering and, and things like that, right? And it's just like, it kind of occurred to me how incommensurable Thing, like just listening to the sound for what it is, is with like the practices by which the sound is, I don't know, existing with and affecting um, Nui people and and the other other than human beings. Um, and so, I just think if we like, I'm I'm really into the idea of like densifying our, our understanding of what sound and music is and could mean and could be. Um, and so I think the, the potential is there. Um, yeah, and it's still, I think it, it'll take projects like, <laughs> like ours, um, mobilizing um, community musicking and things like that. Um, I don't know, that's what I have for now. But. Yeah, just kind of thinking about your question and like, what I've seen so far working with um, with my community, even even how I learned, you know, some of the songs like it's very different depending on your elders that you're working with um, and then teaching them to the children also is, is different, too. But like Tori was saying, you know, kind of changes and like as we know, with like indigenous storytelling. Um, you know, they differ, like sometimes the stories will be different, like if you have a telephone, because it kind of changes along the way. But one thing that I've kind of been like thinking about, and especially like, in some of the dreams that I mentioned that I've had where I like, I'm getting scolded by my elders, and I keep like saying in our language, like, please talk slower, can you say it again, and like getting mad at me, and then like, just like taking that and like, being really patient when I'm teaching, you know, little ones and thinking about how, um, you know, maybe it may not be like, like correct, um, the way that they're, they're performing or they're not singing and, you know, like, especially, you know, as you learn in music, like it has to be like on beat and this many notes long and like, just kind of having that flexibility to, to be, you know, improvise in the situation and to like, allow them, you know, like thinking of like story work and like allowing them to kind of come to their own and like that it may not to get that notion of like oh it has to be this way because it has to be traditional we have to do it like that but kind of like giving like the children especially like the opportunity and like the artistic um ability you know to kind of create like their own or to make new new song and new dance and doesn't always have to be like just what our ancestors did but like that we can do these dances in these same means but it doesn't have to be deemed like traditional or contemporary or you know so kind of getting getting out of that mind frame just kind of going back to like doing things that we have always done with you know the community and singing you know out with to the water to the trees and with the animals and things like that so I think kind of my take on that thank you um yeah are there any questions from the audience yes so this started as a question for Tori, but actually I would uh, love to add both well, because on one hand, I know part of the music education implications of watching, but I don't know is a lot of I'd be interested to know Tori. When you mentioned the memorial as one of the guiding keywords that made me think of the time of memorials uh, statewide standards in uh, Washington State. And one of the things that I consistently hear from folks in music education at uh, UW is that there's nothing there for them to interact with and they very much want that mm -hmm. 
because they understand the importance of the standards, but they don't know necessarily well, people aren't paying attention to music and how do, how do we connect? And so I was wondering, since you're using that keyword and thinking of the, uh, of the search project you discussed, is there any connection for students in potential there for being able to get music, to amplify music within the context of those statewide standards? Mm -hmm. And then, Christina, do those statewide standards exist in your context because you're already doing this community music education? Is, is there is there is there something similar in that context? Is it not there yet? I guess I'm yeah and i think that i i think about this a lot because <laughs> and like even on the on the, the micro like community scale like i think a lot about the ways that we value music um in the ways that we and, and that's like why i purposely use the word densify our understanding right because i think that the potential for accompaniment is palpable in Washington state. Like, like thinking through the ways that we can both, that we already empathize <laughs> with one another, but how we could like riff off of each other in the context of getting things started and um, getting people in the room. Like the, think of the tribal journeys, right? Like that's, that's where I ripped the whole protocol thing, um, the sound protocols, right? Um, that's something that we already do, but it's not necessarily tied to curriculum. Um, for I think just finding those connections could be could be one intervention into that. Um, and so I think that, yeah, like I, I've been really thinking a lot about like how we're already doing a lot of the kinds of work, but like we just need to be all. <laughs> find ways to all get in the same room and have like a, a way to like make this, this practice that we're already doing and have been doing for thousands of years, um, like not fit into, but exceed the, um, the standards by which we value music in, in the in institutions. Um, so I think that's like the big question. Of, yeah. That drives what I do. Yeah. That's it. I, we definitely don't have anything like that in Nevada. And I hope that with my project um, and the connection that I had established with our language class at UNR, um, you know, and if I went back there someday, you know, I would love to do like a great bass and, you know, music course. But I think for me, like the kind of like what Tori was saying, my overall goal, like eventually of the project, once I have a bunch of songs and have the recordings of the dances and have like the notation as well as like the liner notes inside like that's hopefully like after you know like postdoc like working on that to kind of put it together but the main thing for me is to be able to to go to communities in Nevada where they don't maybe they don't have a language or culture center they don't have um, any elders there that are left that know these dances and so that's kind of why I wanted to go like with the documenting of it but in thinking about like hopefully eventually when this comes out and then like establishing like even a place online where people have access to it but not only like for elders like for community members across like the Great Basin to have access to it but also hopefully like they'll see like this is a safe space like we're sharing I hope to eventually like they can add to it so that we're just collecting this huge you know because not everybody you know that that was originally from there lives there so like having access to be able to add to this collection and sharing songs and stories and histories and you know putting that into place because you know unfortunately elders are passing at an alarming rate and so a lot of this is not in the history books and it's taught in schools and so for us to kind of take that back and to be able to to add to that collection and then eventually you know hopefully like the educate the west the our state educations will kind of pick up the slack and maybe by then you know start having some you know local Native history being taught it, taught and having those classes at the university and having those special collections that I've been working with on these recordings. So hopefully someday in the future. Um, are there any other audience? Yeah, we have time. I have one. Um, I heard mentioned, I think, to, I think Tori, you used the word field work at one point. And Christina, you were talking about story work. And knowing that you both are very well traveled individuals, and 
one of you in particular just went up forward to go to New Zealand soon. Do you see potential? And I've asked you this before, but I'll put you on the spot now. Um, to, to think about, you know, John Carlos has talked about in the past where there have been ethnic colleges that have kind of challenges in health to think about homework instead of field work. Mm. But then with Archibald, you have story work. Do you feel like there's something that could be gained from calling what you do sound work mm. or song work um, in terms of how you explain what it is, the work that you're doing, thinking again about the UX in this project? Mm. Like, is there something about sound or song work that you think could do something differently in, in kind of starting conversations with folks back home uh, or going to New Zealand? You know, having been the Philippines to be I mean, I'm just thinking about how we explain what it is we do. Do you see something in, in kind of maybe leading a new direction that could be called sound or something? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have some thoughts. <laughs> I was like, I have some thoughts on that. Yeah, because I think that, and I didn't even really, the field work is one of those take for granted words that you kind of have when you're, writing inaccessible theory dumps. Well, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I think that song work has this really amazing thing where it detaches itself from the disciplinary. Like, and that's like an existential conversation that we have all the time in Native Studies about like, are we a discipline? Are we an anti-discipline? Are we a mega super discipline? Like, <laughs> you know, and so like taking like removing that and instead bringing in song work because we do the song work, you know, that's the thing that we do. And it locates our analysis or whatever you want to call it um, into like, into the density of our indigenous being as, as you would put it in your, in your presentation. And so at that point, it's not about like this thing I'm going to do and then publish and then it's going to lead it's going to plant this little seed and a bunch of other people are going to cite me in the future. Like it's actually just song work. Like this is something that we're doing as relating one Quinault person to whomever I'm working with. Um, and I think that that's a really important intervention. Um, and that's how I try to like, to think about like, that's, I think even going back to how we introduce ourselves, right? Like I like to say that I went to Duwamish to Quamish homelands, not the university of Washington, right? Like, um, yeah, these are all really subtle, but like really world shifting changes. Yeah. And then even with sound, it incorporates the language mm -hmm. and the sound of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was one of my questions I had, but we probably won't have time for it. I had asked like, what does the, what does the sound of language and song do? Um, but to answer your question, I, I'm really glad that I, I was introduced to story work. Um, and there was a part in there she was talking about, you know, we, like for me, I don't say like, oh, I'm going to New Zealand or back home to do research. Cause like, I, I really, really love working with our elders and, and taking the time to sit and talk with them. And I think that's what something in our, in NAS and most indigenous people understand is that, you know, we're not just going to this place and being extractive and just be like, sit down and tell me all the things so I can go back and write a paper and be, when these awards, uh, you know, taking knowledge from indigenous people, we're like Tori said, like, we're actually implementing these things and like the work that we do, which I think is something that we deal with as, uh, as native scholars is that we, you know, it's not just something like we can just put away, you know, like we're not like mathematicians or scientists, just like, in the lab and then put it away and like be done with it like it's with us it's in our heart it's in our families our communities and so for us to take that time to you know hear these songs and to hear the stories and the histories that go with it it's not just research or field research you know that it's it's it means something beyond you know just scholarly work and that will be eventually you know carried on for generations hopefully not just like sitting you know in a library on a bookshelf like that our work means something and to to generate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we can take one more. Um, yeah. 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 So you, you mentioned that you have a lot of still living uh, dialects and 
assuming that most of those are not fluent speakers. Do you have dialects as a way of using the voice? And is that in any way in your, do you have any impression that that reflects geography, more like Geography. Yeah, definitely hearing because I, I am very fortunate enough to work with three speakers that all live in the same vicinity, but they all have three different dialects. And so just hearing the way that they say the same words, I'm more so like, um, and when I teach too, like I'm more concerned about how you say it versus the written component of it, but, but just hearing the differences in the way that they, they say certain words or the way that the, you know, certain words are like flipped. Um, you can definitely hear that. And then thinking back to like that map that I showed and thinking of like the elders and the people that I know that speak, like it really does sound different. And our people were actually trilingual at one point because we were so closely with the, the Western Shoshone and the Washa people. We all, we had to um, go into each other's homelands for, for food. And so that was something that we were non like warring tribe, which I think is really um, says a lot about our people because we, um, had that connection with language and um, we could really could tell where somebody was from, from those, those differences that you're talking about. Okay, I wasn't specific. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. This was a good, yeah. So people, I mean, what, one of the things that someone I knew who was an organist had observed was that, you know, and I didn't even ask part of the question, um, the way we, where we speak from, in our, in our, just like mm. in our, in our sound structures, isn't the same for all of us. And that was when I was saying, asking if you had dialects of the way of using voice, that's kind of what I was wondering. And then I also was wondering, listening to how you were, because you have very clearly like BA voice training, <laughs> um, you know, music department voice training. Do we, so that was what made the question come up to begin with, um, because that's a specific way of using the voice in song. Mm -hmm. And then I was wondering, like, I don't know how much um, I'm sure you have heavy mission, missionizing among your communities and how much uh, hymn singing you think has impacted the way people sing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Yeah, definitely learning. Um, and that was something when I when I was at UNR, you know, I had always sang from when I was just a little girl. I would sing all the time and then did like choir and and then in at UNR I wanted to learn more about how to properly sing, you know, because I just always did it. And um when I was learning songs from elders, it's very different just having the different, you know, telling my voice coach like to do this in your diaphragm and open your mouth. And like, it's completely different from when you learn from elders and they're just telling you to sing from your heart and to, you know, fill your stomach up and sing loud. And like, so it's very different. So that's something that um, I really enjoyed. I enjoyed doing, but, um, uh, and our, where I'm from though, maybe Tori can, can speak because I think you have more um, as far as like with, but with your area about her second part of the question but where I'm from like our um we only had one um one boarding school nearby and then we did have a community uh, a church in our community but most of from what I've seen in my community there's not a lot of like following of Christianity or Catholicism um so I'm not I'm not entirely too sure about that from but from what I've seen but maybe like from from older times there might have been, but not from my experience. I I haven't experienced like the it really influencing our song or the way that we sing. I don't know if you want yeah, to speak to that. I don't I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you both again for your presentation. <laughs> well, we now have a break for lunch, so we'll resume at 12:30 and uh, yeah, we can do that. Thank you. I need to like learn what program I play so that it keeps your time for you. Mm. I need to do that. That was just PowerPoint. Oh, I, yeah, I, was just... I also wasn't paying attention to that at all. <laughs>